this makes a big difference if you compare nowadays with what happened in the 80s when the Commission presented white papers, books, proposals that advocated concrete uh, solutions, uh, concrete uh, measures about promoting European integration. So from a political perspective, I think, and I agree with my colleague, with Professor Papadopoulos, in that uh, current developments uh, verify that uh, intergovernmentalism is dominant. Uh, I think that uh, more dominant than before. This might seem like a paradox because on the one hand we have this uh, various initiatives about uh, democratizing the EU, making it uh, more open to, to participation. But at the same time, I think it's not worth it that all important decisions are being taken by national leaders in European councils or Euro summits as well. And uh, I think that this is also the approach that's going to be followed in the near future. I think this m has become evident, I think, to account the, the initiatives taken by the president of the, of the, of the European Council and this leadership, or leaders agenda that is being promoted, so that is the EU leaders are going to collectively decide or try to decide or try to find a common ground on, on the future of the EU. And uh, I'm afraid that this is the only possible way forward because, and I, again, I, I'm taking the pragmatic or the pessimist view in that, I think that the leap from the current situation from the status quo to federal Europe or a democratic Europe is impossible, given that power still lies at the member state level. And national governments, reasonably, I think, are very reluctant to cede power, to give power, to give up power, uh, give away power, uh, either at the European level or at the regional level. So I think that uh, Europe of uh, autonomous regions is also something that is uh, an idea about what uh, all European governments are more or less hostile or uh, unfriendly towards. So, to conclude, I think that despite all these ideas and plans that circulate, it is rather impossible that in the near future we have a significant uh, increase in the fiscal capacity of the EU. Uh, perhaps this option would become possible The long term, in the long term or in the medium term. Uh, but in the foreseeable future, and uh, at least until the, the next European elections, I, I see again intergovernmentalism through the European Council and uh, uh, not uh, talking about the an amendment of the treaties being the, 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 uh, the method that's going to be applied. So I'll start with that. Thank you for your attention. Ευχαριστούμε και τον κύριο Ανδρέου. Μέχρι στιγμή, τρει στου τέσσερι Έλληνε πανεπιστημιακού ακολουθούν την, ε, την οδό τη απεσιοδοξία ή μάλλον είναι πραγματιστέ. Το συζητούσαμε αυτό με την κυρία Λίμπερτ πριν αρχίσει η εκδήλωση ότι η δική τη προσέγγιση είναι πιο αισιόδοξη. Δεν ξέρω αν είναι ελληνικό φαινόμενο αυτό που προσεγγίζουμε τα πράγματα λίγο διαφορετικά από τη δική μα οπτική. Και η κυρία Λίνα Παπαδοπούλου αναπληρώνει. I'm very optimistic. First of all, politically speaking, I do favor Professor Jürgen Habermas's view. I am definitely in favor of a federalist Europe, democratic, with a democratic Eurozone, and everything Habermas and Professor Liebert is in favor of. However, I'm afraid that uh, all these phenomena that um, we know, what is happening in the European Union, what is happening in the elections, you have already mentioned the Czech Republic and um, Austria, do push us to one of the scenarios that uh, the European Commission has put forward, although the fifth scenario that um, um, you favor, Professor Liebert, did not include that possibility, but I'm not convinced that we are going to avoid that. If you, if you look to the first scenarios that Professor Liebert presented to us, proposed by the European Commission and, and uh, UNCAP, there were 
let's say four substantive scenarios and one procedural one. I'm going to focus on the procedural one. And when I'm saying the procedural one, I mean the one that says those who want can do more. And those who do not want can stay behind. But don't push forward those who cannot or do not want to do more. This is actually not something new in the European Union. We do know that from Eurozone. Eurozone itself is something that, okay, those who cannot do it, they are not in, but something more. In the law, I mean, in the treaties, there is an obligation for those member states who are able to join the Eurozone that they are obliged to do it. Nevertheless, politically speaking, until now, there is no pressure at all to member states such as Sweden or Denmark, for example, who are capable of joining the Eurozone to do it. So, as a matter of fact, flexibility or enhanced cooperation or multiple speeds or however you want to call it or it will be called is here. So, I'm um, optimistically realistic or realistically optimistic that those who do want to go ahead will go, but they will leave others behind. Or if you want it put otherwise or formed it otherwise, those who want to quit national sovereignty or to quit the more bits of national sovereignty will do it, but there will be others who actually will jump into the uh, possibility to take a bit of sovereignty back. And Brexit is one big example, but um, unfortunately, if you ask me again, I'm totally against national sovereignty, but unfortunately, not most um, states or most Europeans would join me in this view. So I see that um, there is a possibility there to form a Europe of multiple speeds or concentric cycles in the meaning of, um, well, yes, let us put it democratically in the national fora because unfortunately we have not managed to create a transnational forum. I have written myself my PhD 20 years ago about European political parties. I was very optimistic at that stage, hoping that European political parties will happen very soon. I was writing in 1990. <coughs> 96, 97, 98, they have not happened until now, 20 years later. So uh, I think they will happen only for those states who do want it. And I don't think this is necessarily bad. It might be bad for Greece, because I'm not sure that we will be able to follow the core of Europe. I hope we, we will change our political minds and um, attitudes and everything, and we will join the core. But um, I think th this is the only possibility for some, some states to go ahead, built on democratic procedures and not on technocratic decisions. Because technocratic decisions, even if in most cases I do agree with them, unfortunately I think are the ones which cause the rise of nationalist populist parties who have a little bit of truth in what they say and big lies, but they push people to that direction they want. And I do find a side effect which is positive here, which is the following. Let's say we do have, let's say Czech Republic and um, uh, Slovenia, two states that more or less um, look alike. Um, let's say that the one decides to go ahead with Germany and France, I hope, with Macron and with Merkel and um, um, with Luxembourg, etc., and the Netherlands. I hope they will stay in the, in the hard core. And let's say Slovenia does decide to go with, and Czech Republic remains behind and say, no, I want back some bits of national sovereignty. So it is a good challenge there to see which one will be best off or better off in 10 years' time. I think it's a challenge that we have to go through. We have to go through because, unfortunately, in these 60 years, we have not managed 
and I mean as Europeans or as European elites if you want, we have not managed to really construct a European transnational democracy, which I very much am in favor of. Um, to the, at the same token, I'm, I'm in favor of Brexit, not because I wanted the UK to go away. I find it very bad, very negative for both the UK and the European Union. But in times of doubt, when it comes to democratic procedures, I do believe that Brexit referendum was a democratic referendum, and it is good that this referendum is going to be realized. On the contrary, as you very well know, the Greek referendum was actually a mockery. I mean, our government has, was just a troll on democratic procedures. Um, yeah, the, well, the world known well, um, uh, word Colotumba is now popular in Catalonia as well. Anyway, so uh, this is my point, and I think that all the other scenarios can only uh, be adopted under this procedural scenario. That was it. Thank you very much. Σε Ένωση και έχουμε ένα παράθυρο ευκαιρία που δεν θα είναι για πολύ ανοιχτό. Νομίζω ότι και τα δύο αυτά επιβεβαιώθηκαν, τα ακούσαμε ω σχόλια, ω παρεμβάσει εδώ πέρα. Και θα ήθελα το τελευταίο σχόλιο και με αυτό να κλείσουμε την εκδήλωση, γιατί πήρατε ένα feedback έτσι από τον κόσμο, τα, τα ζητήματα που τέθηκαν εδώ πέρα, το, το πόσο πάμε στην Ευρώπη των μικρών περιφερειών ή. ή το δημοκρατικό έλλειμμα μπορεί να καλυφθεί επιστρέφοντας στο εθνικό κράτος ή στη πιο μικρή μονάδα ή πηγαίνοντας σε πιο ε, συγκεντρωτικά σχήματα στην Ευρώπη. Από όλα αυτά και από τις παρεμβάσεις που ακούσατε από τους Έλληνες συναδέλφους σας, θα θέλαμε να μας δώσετε και να κλείσουμε με αυτό με μια έτσι, νότα αισιοδοξία για το πού βλέπετε να πηγαίνει η Ευρώπη. Thank you very, very much. Uh, I found all comments, contributions very, very interesting and also very convincing. Uh, you have raised very important points, uh, which, of course, I, I won't want to um, contest uh, or object. Uh, just a few remarks. Um, Janis, you said, um, Neo-mercantilism plus intergovernmentalism, uh, you are in favor of Habermas, but somehow uh, one and the other, they don't go together. And yes, of course. And this is exactly the point to strengthen the community method, a democratic community method with a Eurozone parliament, which would be stronger than the uh, European semester in order to scold or to advise the national, uh, nationally specific recommendations given by the Commission to Germany, for example, that its oh, a trade surplus is a problem. This is just a recommendation, but uh, the Eurozone Parliament could do much more and could, uh, could have a decisive say. So I think uh, the TDEM, TDEM proposal would uh, nicely go with, with Habermas. Regarding the values and the fundamental rights, I think this is what I have been thinking and saying also again, also in Brussels, also the discussing 
with NGOs from all over Europe, the social dimension of the European Union. But this was like uh, an argument always said, um, I found interesting the cases you mentioned because the European Court of Justice responds differently than the Commission, for example. The Commission, which is very much under the uh, pressure of the European Council and they wouldn't speak so frankly about uh, strengthening the Charter of Fundamental Rights in terms of uh, litigation rights by individuals or groups, yeah, class action, for example, which would be something very important. All yeah. of them were dismissed. Yeah, by yeah. The Court of but Justice. we need something like this. Now in Germany with the diesel gate, yeah, so um, the diesel scandal uh, poisoning uh, streets and people and, and health, damaging health. Uh, this is again on the agenda, but the CDU government uh, has delayed it again and again. The Greens are pressing for it and the SPD also. So it's, um, it's up for more struggles and more public pressure and I think Putting the governments under pressure, public pressure, is, is very is indispensable. Um, very quickly, um, Joros, um, the um, major impediments you said uh, to a transfer union. We could discuss and should discuss uh, on, on solidarity, uh, different concepts. Yeah, what I, I wouldn't be. I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't um, say that there is an absence of solidarity. Comparing to the 80s, I think you have a very good point. This has changed. But isn't solidarity something like mutual risk insurance? And we have, through the uh, crisis, uh, financial debt and economic crisis, we have seen the establishment of a mutual risk insurance through the ESM, which is supposed to develop into a European uh, monetary fund. This is, of course, not transfer union. It's not uh, uh, euro bonds, um, but uh, there are also proposals and measures which um, would come closer to that direction. It's better the mic here. Is this better here? Ah, yeah. Okay, sorry. Um, like, for example, investment bonds in instead of, uh, of, uh, of, of uh, euro bonds, which would uh, um, Europeanize state debt, public debt, uh, it would be bonds given out for investment funds, uh, productive investment funds, but you have still a good point saying these are should uh, follow and are supposed to follow normally the economic logic of competitiveness and so on. Um, the European Commission has launched also, <coughs> say, the 20 EU 2020 agenda innovation. Yes, and I social innovation is part of it. And I would want the European Commission and the European Union to explore and further develop social innovations, also in terms of uh, third sector, of um, Genossenschaften of uh, non-for-profit uh, economic developments uh, and so on. Um, the European Investment Bank, for example, is, um, is uh, giving loans for investments, but uh, they are very uh, used to very, very little percentages in Southern Europe, and they are not used by small and medium uh, companies, and uh, let alone by, by, by uh, cooperatives, for example. Yeah? So we should go and develop and put pressure on governments and the EU in terms of that. Um, I think the, uh, the dominance of the intergovernmentalism, everybody agrees here, uh, and I couldn't agree more that this is part of the big problem. I think over the 10 years of crisis, it was a response to the, or let's say, it was a way of practicing the crisis mode of governance. Uh, it shouldn't become and shouldn't be in the future the normal mode of governance. And therefore, the proposals I have outlined here, uh, two of them, Habermas and um, Piketty and others, um, aims at replacing it by uh, new forms of democratic governance. So um, let us see. It is, uh, and I think, 
uh, getting to your last, it is really very fits very well your arg or wraps up very well the um, uh, solutions to the impossible and probable impasses we will see that some governments more than others will be among the coalition of the willing going ahead and others not. Um, I think I'm in favor of Habermas and of Piketty and others <laughs> and Macron and at the same time also of of Juncker because they all um, present bits and pieces and the whole picture and then bits and pieces and the procedural way of uh, saying those who want more go ahead should not, and this is what Juncker says, should not lead to a lasting split of the union. So we need um, a method that those who are who want to stay outside after the next elections will not be forced to continue to stay outside. Yeah? So there should be a continued invitation and call and also support supporting countries who can't make it yet but w are willing and want to help them uh, join the hard core or the solid solidaristic core, hopefully. <laughs> my, my hopeful note. <laughs> Ε, Ποιο από του τέσσερι στο πάνελ θα ήθελε να τοποθετηθεί στι ερωτήσει που έγινε στην αρχή. Ήταν ε, να θυμίσω για, για τις, α, α, τα αυτονομιστικά κινήματα, για το κατά πόσο, αν θυμάμαι καλά, τα, γίνονται τα δημοψηφίσματα, αλλά γίνονται και σεβαστά. Και ε, η τρίτη ερώτηση, βοηθήστε με, δεν την. Ε, α, ναι, ναι, ναι. Για, για, για τις ε, συνέπειες ε, του Brexit, αλλά ναι. Δεν ξέρω αν θέλετε να κάνετε μία σύντομη παρέμβαση. Δάλλως υπάρχει και ε, το αυριανό σεμινάριο που θα ακουστούν και πολλά. Ωραία, οπότε κάπου εδώ να κλείσουμε την αποψήνη πολύ ενδιαφέρουσα βραδιά και να... Ορίστε. I just I have a comment on multiple spe speeds and you know the uh, the fifth scenario. Uh, you, you, uh, there's a fundamental problem and it's an economics problem here. It's an economics problem. A fundamental problem of the multiple speed scenario, the fifth scenario, is the so-called externalities problem, because if you take, for example, the case of the financial transaction tax, the FTT, which is the most characteristic case uh, that you know the Commission pushed. Uh, towards uh, uh, a reinforced uh, uh, cooperation mechanism and not through, through community method. That means that the states that would be left outside, like Great Britain before Brexit though, uh, would automatically have the windfall of gaining uh, business, financial transactions, just because business there is going to be, you know, cheaper. And that is really a fragmentation of the common market as we know it, of the single market as we know it. It's a dangerous thing, I'm sorry to say. It doesn't work. It couldn't work. It might produce bigger problems than the solutions that we would like it to pursue, a especially in economics, I say, because, of course, in defense it might work. That's okay. But defense is a hard core of national sovereignty anyway. So anything that goes in favor of integration, if this is good, but in economics and in the market, that would bring a fragmentation, for example, to the financial integration that is already there. And I think that we should really be very cautious and very careful and the, on this. And the proof, I think, is that Juncker just swept aside the fifth scenario in his September Union speech and says, okay, I talked about it and everybody talked about this fifth scenario and now I'm gonna talk about the sixth scenario, which is a hidden federalist, actually, agenda, I think. So I just wanted to make this comment. Thank you. Νομίζω ότι έχετε δώσει πολλές αφορμές για συζητήσεις αύριο. Έτσι, έχουμε συζητήσει θέματα, αλλά έχουμε καθίσει πολλά ανοιχτά θέματα. Οπότε 
Το αυριανό σεμινάριο νομίζω ήταν πάρα πολύ ενδιαφέρον. Σας ευχαριστούμε όλους όσοι μείνατε μέχρι τέλος. Και ευχαριστούμε και την παρέμβασή σας και φυσικά και το ίδιο Χαίνριχ Μπέλ που έδωσε την ευκαιρία στους καθηγητές τους από τα δύο πανεπιστήμια της πόλης και την καλεσμένη μας από τη το κέντρο Ζαν Μονέ και το Πανεπιστήμιο της Βρέμης να είναι εδώ και να μοιραστούν όλες αυτές τις πολύ ενδιαφέρουσες απόψεις.